Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is Session 14, Part 3 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, focusing on the role God has and how God is and can be involved in our personal processes of forgiveness and repentance. The session was recorded on the 17th of April, 2018, from 10.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. How God's laws indirectly help me to forgive and repent. So by now we're up to discussing how God's involved in this forgiveness and repentance process. And we've spoken about the very direct personal ways God is involved. We've spoken about how... Um, sort God, of the less direct ways. The less direct which ways. Which are all it? revolving around God trying to influence others to influence us. Yes. <laughs> sort of thing. To help the us third see. third party influence, yes. uh, if you could call it yep, that. Yeah, third party influence. Now we're up to the actual laws of the universe, this... You called it in our introduction, this complex framework. And in our third assistance group in 2016, you introduced this idea that there is law, specific laws, but governing all law are principles. Mm. And really, so here in this part of the discussion, we're going to be talking about principles and laws, really, mm. um, and how all of those things that God has created are leading us and helping us to get to the point of forgiveness and repentance mm. yeah yep. that's good yeah so let's talk about it in in a little bit more detail how god's laws indirectly help me to forgive and repent yes well the first thing we need to bear in mind about all of god's laws are that the happiness and growth of the individual is why god created law mm. so it's the whole point of having laws is so that every individual who ever exists in the universe is able to be happy mm. and able to grow. Mm. So when you understand that that is the point of law, mm. now you can start to have some respect for law. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if you think law is just for the sake of punishing you or controlling you, which mm. is what most people think about people law and human yeah. law, and you start imposing that belief on God's law, mm -hmm. well, obviously now you, 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 you feel God's laws are just nuisance, yes. right? which is different to what the true purpose of God's laws are. God's laws have only been created to assist us, yeah. to help us grow, survive and thrive. Yeah. That's the purpose of God's laws. And we stated that, I think, quite clearly in that third assistance group mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, so now, that, now that we uh, know the purpose of God's laws, <laughs> We can start to see, well, okay, everything that's happening to me, every event in my life is controlled by law. Yeah. There's a response to my soul mm -hmm. that occurs in the environment around me, that surrounds me. And all of it's helping me to expand awareness, to help me grow, to thrive. To thrive to and be happy. Be happy. That's the point yes. of it. Yeah. Right? So if I'm becoming unhappier, mm. there's a good chance that I'm breaking law, yeah, <laughs> trying to break yeah. law yeah. because I'm becoming unhappier. Mm -hmm. And let's look at unhappier. Unhappier could mean I'm more sick. Well, there's a good chance I'm breaking some law. Yeah. Um, unhappier could be just uh, more unhappy in my personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Good chance that I am breaking law. Yeah. Unhappy in my life. Good chance that I'm breaking law. You know, so I engage a whole heap of desires, addictions that I think are satisfying, should be satisfying, but they don't satisfy me. Good chance I'm a breaking law. Mm. This, uh, and the pain that I get as a consequence shows me that. And then there's certain things that bring us pleasure. Mm. And we go, and it's not addiction, it's, I mean, true pleasure, true happiness, Lasting, true, sort of true sense of uh, fulfilling, like, yeah. wonder yeah. that occurs in our life at moments, unfortunately. Yeah. For most people, it's not very many moments, mm. but it happens. Those times you can go, well, what is it now that causes me to feel this particular thing? Well, obviously, I've done something in harmony with law yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, have this particular result. Mm. And once you have this understanding, it's going to open your awareness to, OK, what's right and what's wrong in mm. your life. The things that have caused pain and suffering are obviously wrong. Yeah. We need to fix them. Yeah. The things that cause 
like permanent pleasure for everyone involved, mm -hmm. right? Happiness and satisfaction for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. They're obviously good things, mm. right? And, and most uh, most of the time, no, mm -hmm. not maybe all the time, because you know the world has some pretty warped ideas about what love is and what addiction should be. Yeah. But a lot of the times they might be right. Mm -hmm. So this shows me that ah, this is me maybe heading in the right direction, mm -hmm. and uh, I need to do more of that. Yeah, and so we get through this interface or interaction that you spoke about in the introduction. We get this feedback. Oh, some things feel good in a very real, grounded, fulfilling way. Some things feel bad in a very sustained, yucky kind of, uh, the hits just keep on coming, you know, bad way. Um, so we get a sense of right and wrong from that if we're sensitive. <laughs> to of, a degree. Yes, to, a, to degree. a degree. But also something else is that each law is designed to guide us to an awareness of the higher laws, isn't it? So. Yes. There you're talking a lot about some of the principles we talked about in um, compensation, yes. so penalty and reward, but there's also this other aspect, isn't there, where each law is guiding us to become aware that there's a higher law that could supersede this. So how does that really work? Well, um, you could say there's, after a while we start to learn that there seems to be two sets of laws. Mm. There's one set of law that deals with me when I'm resistive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That when I'm like opposing the law mm, mm. and then there's another set of laws that seem to operate upon desire mm. and this is a very cool thing to recognize once you get to the state of recognizing that because mm -hmm. you start to see okay if I lack desire yeah certain things happen to me mm. but if I have desires other different things happen to me yeah so it seems like there's a group of laws that seem to act upon desire Mm. Now, this is very interesting. If I now have a desire to know more, mm. a desire to know more truth, a desire to understand more love, obviously that would be a good desire, something that will benefit myself mm. and benefit others. Therefore, I'm probably going to experience some more positive rewards mm. for that. And, and so we start seeing the hierarchy of law there. There's, there's the underlying laws seem to act upon my state, you know, mm. what I just feel... Does it, what I do automatically every day. Yeah, my you could say how my addictions yeah. drive me every day. They seem yeah. to act upon that. Yeah. And, and most of those laws obviously are going to be corrective. In yes. other words, they're going to have some pain associated with it mm -hmm. and we'll eventually recognise the pain. Mm -hmm. But then there's these other groups of laws that act upon desire. So, you know, like I see a person, like even if it's a person opposite, you know, I'm not in a relationship, I see a person opposite, sex, I feel like I want to get to know them. I act upon the desire, I take some effort, I, you know, to do it. And lo and behold, I now get to know them. Mm. Uh, the be positive benefit is of getting to know the person, feedback into the system. And I go, oh, there, I acted upon my desire and look what happened. Mm. And I start seeing, oh, if I act upon my desires, different things might happen. Mm. Positive things might happen. And if my desires are more in harmony with what is what I can see to be morally right or mm. ethically right, mm -hmm. it seems to work even more. Mm. So, I, so I act more in harmony with that. And now the law is teaching me yeah. what I need to do. So two things from what you've just said. The first thing is, it seems to me that we can have an awareness of that very dynamic that you're talking about without really knowing it's law even. That's right. We just kind of understand life works like this and if I do it this way, it works better. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we don't even have to have known it's law. We just go, it works. <laughs> yeah. This works and yeah. this does not. Yeah. So, so what I should do is more of what works and less of what does not. Yes. That's the way we see it. Yes. And even if you don't believe in God, you'll probably do that. Yeah. yeah. And the second thing from what you said is that it seems to me, and it's again, it's the difference between, say, natural love way and God's way, is that you talked about having this difference in desire and state of just normalcy. This is what it is. But there's also this thing that we can learn, isn't there, where I go, look, when I do that thing, it doesn't work out. It never works out. I'm just going to stop doing it. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to stop doing it. Um, and I want to stop doing it, but then there's there's the other desire which actually engages the higher law, which is I want to never do that. I want to find the reason that I do that so that I never am tempted to do it again. 
Yeah, I feel very few people get to that point. Um, I but think, that is repentance, isn't it? Of course, of yeah. course. But very few people do get to that point using just law. Mm. Um, of course it happens, mm. but, but the majority of people just feel they've got to strive. So, so for example, you, you get an alcoholic is a good example. Mm. A person who's driven to drink. Obviously, there's a lot of sadness in their life that they're angry about. That's what yeah. causes them to go to drink. Yeah. They want to avoid the sang sadness and they have an expectation they should be able to avoid the sadness mm. using, a, using a substance. And so they engage the substance and they don't care about the results that has to themselves or to others in their life. Mm -hmm. That's what drives alcoholism. It's not a disease, mm -hmm. as people would say. Well, I no, more than, many of them out there. no more than anything else that we do is a disease. Of course, disease it's the of same the disease. Yeah. Yeah. You could say yeah. that every addiction is the like, yeah. same disease to obesity, the same yeah. disease for sexual promiscuity. They're all the same kind of disease, which mm -hmm. is all driven by some emotional cause, yeah. right? But I wouldn't call it a disease like doctors call it yeah. a disease. Yeah. So, so here, here it is. There's a driven set of behavior that goes on, driven by some underlying sadness. I'm, oh, I feel justified to mm -hmm. avoid. And I feel like the substance, you know, though it's available, I can have it. So I might as well have as much of it as I want. And that's my substance to avoid whatever is going on in my life at any one point in time to make me feel happier and like I don't have to take responsibility, right? Yep. Now, that alcoholic goes to like AA, for example. Let's mm -hmm. say they recognize, oh, this is a, causing me a lot of trouble, right? Yeah. Uh, this whole attitude. And they go to AA and they learn about some 12 steps, mm -hmm. right? So many of these steps, actually, if they were engaged emotionally, yep. would actually cure the alcoholism completely. Yeah. Right. But, but now they think alcoholism is a disease. Yeah, yeah can't be cured yeah right so so now they're not looking at curing it they're just looking at controlling it so mm -hmm. instead of going through the process emotionally they go through it because they told they have to right to stay in stay in aa basically it's like a you know you got to do it you know yep. this is what, what has to be done and while no one's forcing them to do it at the end of the day there is this underlying suggestion that has to be done so so they don't engage that process emotionally naturally it doesn't work mm -hmm. so sooner or later they're going to revert back to drinking mm -hmm. right because they haven't found the cause yeah they haven't dealt with the cause yeah now in this process though they should find out that forcing themselves to get through something like drinking too much doesn't really work because they still abstain from drinking you mean yeah, yeah they still feel like having a drink yeah even after 20 years yeah. still feel like having a drink this is why they think it's a disease yeah because they still feel like having a drink yeah even after 20 years of abstaining trying hard every day to abstain mm -hmm. and of course the trying hard every day to abstain builds up the anger builds up the resentment and so forth as well so yep. it's like a powder keg at some point it's going to explode right yeah now if that person could get get to the stage of going there must be a cause yes now they have a great opportunity yep. to resolve this in mm -hmm. right the damage that's being done yes have a great opportunity. Unfortunately, though, nobody, not many people on earth, it seems, want to hear mm -hmm. that there is a cause of anything. Yeah. <laughs> so most people want to hear that it's something outside of your control, mm -hmm. something that you do not are, are unable to determine for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what they want to hear. Mm. And because they want to hear that, there's lack of personal responsibility. And the lack of personal responsibility eventually is going to lead you to drink again. Yeah. In the case of the alcohol, mm -hmm. but in the person who's alcoholic. However, if you imagine for a moment that the person went through, got through this stage and realised that actually there must be a cause. Mm. Just because the law of compensation is working on them that whole time. Not only that, the, with other things, there always seems to be a cause. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with everything on the planet, there always seems to be a cause. Something yep. is cause and effect. The, mm -hmm. the law, you know, is rife, <laughs> you could say. It, it's everywhere in yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's everywhere in life. Yeah. You know, so, so why wouldn't it apply to my alcoholism? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make any sense logically. So they may get to that point yeah. where they realize that. Now, the law is the only thing that's going to bring them to that point. Yes. In that stage, they're not open to hearing it from anybody else. So the law has to get them to that point. Yeah. Right. Now, of course, if they were more open to hearing that it's not a disease, mm -hmm. 
but it's an actual condition of the soul. Mm -hmm. You could say a disease of the soul. Yeah, that's how I think. An emotion, an addiction inside of the soul, Mm -hmm. emotion inside of the soul that they're unwilling to address and they could come to realise that, then they could cure their alcoholism. They could cure it completely. Yeah. Get to a stage where they don't even feel like a drink anymore, don't even think about it. Yeah. And if they did have a drink, they taste it and they go, it's terrible, you know? Because it does taste like poison after you <laughs> got through that emotionally, you yes. know. It just tastes like you're putting some poison in your mouth. Yeah. You know, nowadays I can't even smell the stuff without <laughs> feeling it's poisonous. So it's like it's you shift, you know, mm-hmm. you make you make the shift and then you have the realisation by making the shift that, ah, oh, law obviously governs. One law, which is a law of cause and effect, governs me. I need to find the real cause mm-hmm. before I can cure something. Mm-hmm. The real cause, not not the thing I'd like it to be, mm-hmm. or the pill popping way of cause of curing it, mm-hmm. but the actual real underlying reason why this particular thing's happened. Now, if a person obtains that lesson in one area of their life, mm-hmm. highly likely it'll go across to heaps of other areas into their life. But to spell it out, you're saying that the the working of the law of compensation in that case would lead us to become open to the fact that there's causes for problems and that we must remove causes and that would bring in order to permanently solve the problem and then that would lead us to be more open to the laws of forgiveness and repentance. Of course it'll be make us more open to the law even by saying okay my alcoholism is uh, uh, my alcoholism is not a disease. Yes. Like in the traditional doctor sense of mm. a disease. It's not something outside of my control. It's not something outside of my control. Yeah. It's something to do with my emotional condition that causes it. Yeah. And if I address my emotional condition, I can cure it. Mm-hmm. And I have to address this emotional condition truthfully, honestly, mm-hmm. in order to cure it. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, people who do that will cure their alcoholism, so-called alcoholism. They'll cure it. But very few get to that point, like I say. And the main reason why is because we don't want to believe that everything has a cause that is in our control. Under control. Yeah. That is in our control. Yeah. We want to believe it's in somebody else's control. Yeah. And usually we want to even believe that it's in, like, sort of like God's god's control you know like god made a flawed system and i've just got to live with it now type of thing yeah is what a lot of people believe if they believe god in god at all Mm. if they don't believe in god at all they want to believe that it's some kind of physical receptor in the brain that causes it not understanding that every desire in the soul affects the physical receptors in the brain and the physical receptors in the brain are just like the effects of yeah what is the real cause yeah that's all yeah. So, you know, you can get to the stage of realizing all of these things. You can, without God's help, mm-hmm. but it's pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. You usually get to a certain point where you realize that certain behavior is not right. So mm-hmm. the alcoholic realizes that their behavior eventually is not right. Mm-hmm. Many of them realize that. So they get to that point. They realize they must control it. They must. So in other words, there's a certain degree of repentance for their past behavior because they they're now going, well, it's wrong. It causes damage to everybody and me. Mm-hmm. I've got to stop. Mm-hmm. But they don't go beyond that point mm. because there's no faith in a complete cure yes. to the problem. Yeah. There's no faith. In, there's no knowledge of how to cure the problem yeah. for there be to a complete cure of the problem. Mm-hmm. So, so in the case of the alcoholic, we can see they have learnt some law and this has helped them partially repent for past behavior because they stopped their behavior that caused a lot of their negative actions, Mm -hmm. which was the drinking. Can we say someone can partially repent though? Because I'm a little bit... Well, they at least... They've recognized some wrong in their behavior. They're at least on the beginning of the road. Gotcha. Don't they? You know, to be completely unaware is to just keep drinking and not care about the results of your behavior. Yes. That, yes. To yourself or others. Yes. That would be complete unawareness. Yeah. Getting to the stage where you know this is damaging me and damaging other people in my life. Yeah. And, and out of love for them and love for me, I, I have to stop. Mm-hmm. And even forcing yourself to stop is a better place. Yeah. Because you, you're recognizing at least that that behavior is wrong. So mm-hmm. there is at least some level of repentance. 
Mm -hmm. even though you haven't got to the cause. Gotcha. You've at least got on the road to repentance, mm -hmm. right? And, and you can stop a lot of bad things happening on the road. Yes. <laughs> you know, even though you're not fully repentant yet, mm -hmm. you can stop a lot of bad things happening. So at least the law has helped you get even to that point. Yeah. To the point of awareness, mm -hmm. right? That there is a problem and I need to do something about it, even though you may not know what to do about it. Yes. Or nobody might have educated you what to do about it. And the world, ex the world itself doesn't know what to do about it. Yes. Right. So, so even though you've got to that point, that's a better point mm -hmm. than just continuing the behavior that ruins your own life and ruins other people's lives. Yeah. And obviously you'll be rewarded through mm -hmm. the law of getting to that point mm -hmm. and, and changing your behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. But obviously it requires more. The true repentance requires more, but that requires more awareness of more law. Mm -hmm. And this is where most people, you know, don't convert that first awareness yep. into the awareness of the law of cause and effect. In other words, if I solve the cause, the effect will disappear. Mm. So my feeling or that drives me to alcohol is my problem. Mm. And that's the thing I need to address. Mm. If, and that, you know, most people don't go that far. Yeah. But they could. Yes. Hmm. And you're saying that God is trying to encourage them of to course. reach that point. Yeah, through God's trying to get through through the hopelessness of the fact that they still desire drink. Yeah. You know, the fact that you still desire it, even though you've stopped your behavior, is an indication there must be a deeper cause. Yes. And the law itself is demonstrating through that, that there's got to be a deeper cause because mm -hmm. you still feel like drinking. Mm -hmm. You still, even though you know it's wrong, even though you know it's damaged your life, even though it's harmed other people in your life that you love, you, you still feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a deeper problem, mm -hmm. right? That's the, if you were truly open, you'd go to that deeper problem. But even stopping your behavior is one step in the right direction, right? Yeah. 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 So this is how the law helps you. Yeah. The law causes this awareness. And now you're in a state where at least you're on the road to repentance. You know that behavior is wrong and it's harmed other people and you don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about how God's principles of truth help me to forgive and repent. So in the introduction, I talked about how principles govern law. And this here, we're talking about the fact that there's a principle of truth that governs all operations Every of law. the universe. Yep. So how does that principle that impacts on the workings of every law help us towards forgiveness and repentance? All right. Well, this principle of truth basically says that God's laws are going to expose the truth at mm. every single opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, they are constantly engaged to expose truth. Yeah. So, so once this, this principle is in action in everybody's life, you know, example, the average person who tries to cover up, you know, an infidelity in their marriage, mm -hmm. eventually someone finds out. <laughs> Sooner or later, it's very rare for people to pass and their partner hasn't found out. Absolutely. Very rare. Yeah. But even if that happened, mm -hmm. as soon as they pass, they become aware. Yeah. So the so partner becomes the aware. The partner becomes yeah. aware. So so because they can read your soul, right? Yeah. They can read everything that's happened. So now it will be exposed. Mm -hmm. There's the principle of truth working in order to see show you what you need to be repentant for. And forgive. In the case of the partner, forgive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so truth is always being exposed. This principle of truth is governing every single thing that happens in the world, every single thing that happens physically, emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. everything that happens yep. is all governed by this underlying principle of truth. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can see that one principle, then your life will substantially change. Yeah. And instantly you'd go, okay, I haven't, I've lied here, I've lied here, I've lied here, I've lied here, I've lied here. I've covered over the truth 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 here. All of that's wrong. Yeah. And it's going to be. There's a whole list of things I've got to repent for there. Yes. And then whenever anybody else tries to cover over truth with you, lie there, lie there, lie there, lie there, or, you know, cover over truth there. You don't know, be transparent. Don't be transparent there. Mm -hmm. Dove sinned against you. Yeah. Quite simple. Yeah. And now I've got the ability to determine which ones tell the truth, which ones not. 
to a degree. Yeah. And now I've got the ability to see what I need to forgive and what I need to repent for. Yeah. Quite clearly. Yep. If I understand that one principle of truth. Mm. So anything that causes us to take an action where we cover over the truth. So, so even living in your facade mm. is breaking this principle of truth. Mm -hmm. All right. God's laws are trying to expose your facade. Mm -hmm. That's why sooner or later people say, ah, you don't really think that. <laughs> yeah. You really think this. Yep. Yeah. Because your facade is going to be exposed. God's laws are trying to do it all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Once we understand that, we can engage it. Once we can engage it, we can see exactly what we need to repent for and mm. what we need to forgive. Mm. 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 Very good. Mm. All right. How does God's principle of love help me to forgive and repent? Well, remember that all of God's principle, all of God's laws contain this underlying principle that it, it wants to lead, a, to lead us to higher conditions of love. The reason why it is the case is because higher condition of love means a higher condition of happiness. Mm -hmm. So everything in God's universe is designed to lead us to a higher condition of happiness mm -hmm. by leading us to a higher condition of love. Mm -hmm. Right. So this underlying principle. Now, every time we do something unloving, mm -hmm. there must be a corrective system, right? Yes. Because if there's not a corrective system, we would think that doing the unloving thing is fine. Mm -hmm. We would think that going ahead and doing the unloving thing is going to benefit me. So that's all I need to worry about. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about anybody else. But the fact that that doesn't happen, yeah. that when we take an unloving action, it usually affects us as well as the other person. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't realize that on earth, we definitely see that soon after we've passed. Yeah. We then start saying, ah, it's because I was unloving that I did those, that mm -hmm. those things happened. Mm -hmm. And the pain I'm in now and the suffering that I was feeling now is because I was unloving. Yeah. This can help me see and analyze all of my unloving actions mm. and then assess them to go, OK, is this action loving or unloving? And then assess them by the pain they caused. Yeah. Right. Did they cause a lot of pain for myself and others or was it pleasure for myself and others? Mm -hmm. And it lets me make this assessment. So any unloving action always creates pain and suffering mm -hmm. and any loving action always eventually creates happiness. Yes. Eventually, I'll get to see that. Yeah. Eventually. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of people on earth who already see this. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. They might not like they still might have a flawed view of love. Yeah. But a lot of people already see that if you go to war with a country, it's not good. That if you, you know, you're going to be violent, it's not good. Mm -hmm. They already see these particular things, yeah. right? They, they can see the negative results of an unloving act. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people also that are starting to see the positive results of a loving act. Yeah. Even though their idea of love might be flawed. Mm hmm they still take an action mm -hmm. that they believe is more loving and there is more positive result from that action, yeah. which is feeding back, telling them this principle. Yes. You take a more loving action, there are going to be more positive results. You take mm -hmm. a more unloving action, there are going to be more negative results. Mm -hmm. This at least lets me learn that love obviously seems to guide, be one of the rules yeah. of the universe yeah. that I have to play with. Yes. Right? <laughs> I can be more unloving and I, and I see the pain. I can be more loving and there's pleasure. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that even if I don't believe God exists, obviously there's a rule of life, yeah. which is the more loving I am, the more higher tendency there is for me to have a happier life. Yeah. And since forgiveness mm. and repentance are both loving acts, eventually I'm going to figure out that forgiving and repenting are the best things to do aren't I? Yeah. yeah yeah eventually i'm going to get to the point of saying right obviously if if i am taking an unloving act because i'm resentful mm -hmm. or i feel hateful or i feel angry then and that results in more pain and suffering obviously the cause of my unloving act is my resentment mm. and my hatred mm -hmm. so i should probably deal with that 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Why am I so resentful? Why do I feel so much hatred? You know, and this is one reason why in the Western world in particular, there's a, la a large number of psychiatrists. Yes, <laughs> because and psychologists are, and yeah, therapists. Yeah, psychologists and, and so yeah. forth. Because there's plenty of people who see there's pain, yeah. emotional pain, and they they feel like they've got to address some of it. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how to. Yeah. And oftentimes, unfortunately, the psychologist might not know how to either. Yeah. But at least the person knows mm. that there is a link between pain in their life and some kind of driven behavior that they have yeah. that causes that pain yeah. that needs to be repaired. Yeah. And, and they might go through a degree of repair, mm -hmm. even though they might not complete it. Yeah. But at least they've begun the process of repentance or forgiveness there. Mm -hmm. So they may know, for example, so the average person who's been sexually abused, for example, knows they're probably going to need some psych psychological help yeah. to get through their abuse because there's a lot of pain caused by it. Yeah. And that that pain influences their relationships and their decisions and their choices. So the average person who has severe harm, like sexual abuse, knows that. Yeah. So they will often go and seek some help. Mm -hmm. The problem is on the planet is the average person who has not been severely abused in some way doesn't believe that they have any harm yeah. inside of them that causes their, yeah. and, and really all of us need a psychologist, but, <laughs> but we need God to be the God psychologist the probably. Yeah. <laughs> because, because at the end of the day, we all need to come to see that there, the harm inside of us, it's that that causes us to take actions that are negative. Mm -hmm. The problem is for, the, for humanity at the moment is we accept a certain degree of harm mm -hmm. as normal. Yeah. That's where we have our problem. Yes. Our view of love is that, oh, it's normal to get harmed this much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that needs to change. Obviously, we have to have higher standards. Yes. That, you know, no, it's normal to not get harmed at all. You know, that needs to be our standard. Yeah. Right? And that needs to be our goal. But obviously, that's not the goal of the majority of humanity. Mm -hmm. We have a high tolerance for harm of self. And we also, because of that, have a high tolerance towards our taking harmful actions towards others. Yeah. And both of those things need to change. Mm -hmm. But for many people who have been severely harmed, that's already changing. Yes. Because they, they've already been severely harmed. They can see the effects of that severe harm in their life and they want to change it. Yeah. So they know they have to go through something to change it. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what to do yeah. in most cases, which is unfortunate. There needs to be more education as to what to do, yeah. but but at least they're on the road. And this yeah. is how another way the law of principles of truth, of love, yeah. put us on the road. Yeah. Because they put us on the road because they show us, oh, you were treated unlovingly and look at the result. Yes. It's a painful result. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't treat people unlovingly because you're mm -hmm. going to get painful results from doing that. Yeah. And this is a way the principle of love can help us get into the state of at least being even aware that we need to forgive or repent. Mm. 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 Very true. Mm. Yeah. So finally, do you have any comments on how God's laws generally help me forgive and repent? Well, obviously in our forgiveness and repentance sessions that we've done already, we've, we discussed like five sessions was it on conversation. conversation. Yeah. So we discussed a lot of principles there about how a conversation works, what goes on with conversation. This is a primary law, of course, mm -hmm. that, it, that it affects and governs us with regard to bringing us into awareness that mm -hmm. we're doing something wrong that we need to repent for, mm -hmm. or that others have done things wrong that we need to forgive and that not forgiving causes problems for us. Mm. You know? And there's other laws that act kind of in unison with the laws of conversation, isn't there? Like the law of attraction and these things that are bringing us kind of messages, but every law that operates similar to the law of compensation, they're all designed, aren't they, to kind of uh, grind us into submission, into a point of forgiving, of yeah, opening bring up. us to a point of awareness yep. is the problem. You know, like, and also the fact that we don't want awareness, you know. The, mm -hmm. So, so the, the laws that grind us, you could say which are the laws that govern our condition, are governed by our condition, yep. which are not the same as the laws governed by our desires. Mm -hmm. The laws that govern our by governed by our condition, which are law of conversation, law of cause and effect, law of attraction, and other laws like that, they operate in all cases. These kind of laws help us become aware. 
mm-hmm. of what needs to be forgiven and what need, we need to repent for. Yeah. They show us through personal examples in our own life uh, what happens to a person who takes a certain course of action that's unloving and then what happens to a person who takes a certain course of action that's loving. Mm-hmm. And they help us make comparisons. Mm-hmm. And this is very beneficial. If none of these laws existed, what would we do? It'd be like lawless, not making any comparisons mm. whatsoever. And it would be hard for us to figure out that um, there might be a better way of, you know, even a higher law. If we didn't have even the lower laws, we'd be, how would we ever know to seek for a higher law? Yeah, if the law didn't exist at all, mm-hmm. imagine we would have no understanding of pain, pleasure, mm-hmm. what causes pain or pleasure. We'd have no understanding of uh, authority. We'd have no understanding of um, uh, responsibility or any of these other things that all that any person with free will needs to have. Yeah. Because we need to see ourselves as responsible beings mm-hmm. that do things that cause damage or good, you know, depending yeah. on what we choose. Yeah. So we need to come to that realisation. And all of the laws are there to help us come to these realisations. Mm-hmm. So we, we must remember they are all loving they're all compassionate. Yeah. They all help us as best they can help us given our condition. Yeah. So each law is acting the softest it can possibly act yeah. to overcome our resistance. Yeah. So so you can see that if my resistance is right down here, yeah. then I, I, I don't need much mm-hmm. to get beyond it. And therefore, mm-hmm. I'm going to have probably an easier time of it. But if my resistance is right up here, yeah. I'm going to need a lot of events happening and a lot of corrective action happening so the pain exceeds my resistance so that I can can become aware. What it really gets down to is a choice on our part. How much resistance do you want to keep exercising? And the question really becomes, how much pain do you want to keep experiencing? Ignoring in yeah. a lot of times. Well, and and this is back to the princess and the pea thing, isn't it? You know, you're going to have to experience it anyway. Yes. Whether you're ignoring it now, you're going to have to experience it sometime. So, so it's like, how much pain are you going to deal with? How yeah. much pain are you going to have to address? Yeah. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to make yourself more sensitive yeah. so that you don't have to have as much pain mm-hmm. before you have breakthroughs into yeah. realizing what you should and shouldn't do? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to keep increasing your pain levels so that you have to have a lot more pain in order to actually have a breakthrough? Mm. It's a personal choice, but a choice that we're all faced with, right? Yeah. So God's helping us go see through these interactions with law. You, If you become more sensitive to it, mm-hmm. your pain levels are going to be lower. Mm-hmm. This is good, <laughs> unless you're a sadist or a masochist. It's good. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The pain levels are lower for everybody. Right. Yeah, that's what we want. But that requires heightening sensitivity to what we need to forgive and repent. Mm. Yeah, so that's all the laws that operate similar to the law of compensation. But then there's also these higher laws, isn't there, about the flow of God's love. And they are all governed by desire. Correct. And once we start to become sensitive to these laws, that opens up a whole new world of possibilities doesn't it it does yeah so on one hand we've now examined the you know we we now understand the consequences of the the laws that don't operate on desire they're operating just on correction and we can see how they lead us towards forgiveness and repentance yes because i certainly are doing that yeah now if we contrast that with the laws that govern the flow of god's love forgiveness and repentance are two of them But there's others. So they're all laws based around desire. Yes. Really. So it's about how to exercise desire in the human soul in order to make change. Mm -hmm. Once we start recognizing that desire has a powerful effect, positive effect in our life. Yes. In all different aspects of our life, we usually become a bit more open to the concept that maybe there are desires that we need to engage that will help my life become happier sooner. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is what the laws of repentance and forgiveness do. Yeah. They help you become happier sooner. Yes. And uh, and that's what you start to engage. So we start to see, goodness me, when I engage with desire and loving intention, ba- desire based on loving intention, the rewards I keep receiving are yeah. much quicker. They're better. They're- so maybe I'll give an example. I had a relationship 20 years, right, let's say. Yep. I have a relationship 20 years with somebody it took me 20 years to realize that person was an abusive person. Yeah. 
Like, how sad is that? Yeah, I wasted sad. 20 years of my life trying to have a relationship with a person who's never going to change and just be an abusive person. Mm -hmm. right. That tells me that the law, one of these laws based on condition, mm -hmm. were grinding me to the point where I come to that realisation. Yeah. Okay. So the next relationship I have, I look at it far more honestly, mm -hmm. far more openly. I'm far more honest about no, this is abuse, this is not abuse. Mm -hmm. This is not. This is good behaviour, this is bad behaviour. I talk to my partner about it. When I feel my partner mm -hmm. doesn't want to change it, I say, no, that's the end of this relationship now yeah. because you don't want to change that behaviour. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm now engaging desire. Mm -hmm. I'm now saying, no, I desire to have a good relationship. I'm not going to ignore the fact that I've got a bad one. Yeah. I'm going to desire, I desire to have a good one. I want to work through the issue with you as much as I can, but if you don't want to at all, then let's go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. so, so that we don't have to worry about it. But I want to work through the issues with you, but you're going to have to work through them too. Yeah. You know, this is what makes a good relationship. I'm now living in desire. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is without God involved even. Mm -hmm. I've now got positive benefit. There's yeah. a higher likelihood that second relationship it's going to be better. is going to be much better than the first one. Yeah. Because of desire. Yeah. My willingness to work through issues. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the 20 years prior, I wasn't willing, yeah. neither were they. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have stayed 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, both of us weren't willing for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in this one, now I'm working positively to deal with things. That indicates I'm now having a desire. Mm -hmm. That desire will probably be rewarded. Either a relationship will last shorter. Mm -hmm. It'll be, yeah, it'll yeah. Be, won't last at all Yes. because I've challenged something that you know, we work out, no, it's not right, right from the beginning. Yep. Or the relationship's going to be a very good, positive, equal relationship yep. because we're both working through the issues that come up in the relationship. And But you're saying that in itself is going to lead us towards forgiveness and repentance. That operation <clears throat> of God's laws that respond in our, to us in yep. that state will be leading us towards forgiveness and repentance, well, the uh, awareness of it, the well, understanding of it. If you compare it. those two relationships now, we mm -hmm. can see... Oh, in my past relationship, I didn't have the guts yep. to raise these issues that needed to be raised, and yep. I didn't have the guts to change. Yep. Right? Neither did my partner. That's something I need to repent. But mm -hmm. straight away, I see what I need to forgive them for and what I need to repent for yeah. myself. Yeah. Straight away, right? Yes. Because I can compare the two. Yes. So, so this has helped me greatly now because now I'm in a new state, new relationship. I'm focused on truth. The law has helped me see that I must do it in order to have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, this is wonderful. And this is how it helps me positively. To forgive and repent. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. How the design of my soul helps me forgive and repent. Hmm. So this is our fourth sort of answer to how God is involved in helping us forgive and repent. We've talked about the very direct personal way. Hmm. We talked about... Uh, the indirect assistance through people, other people in spirit or on earth, helping us to engage that process of forgiveness and repentance. We've talked about God's laws and the principles that govern the laws and mm. how that whole operation leads us towards forgiveness and repentance. Now we're up to our fourth aspect, which is actually the design of how my soul has been created. Mm. So how does this design assist me to forgive and repent? Yeah, well, firstly, um, we need to just remind everybody that the the way the laws work, you can create a framework of a law if you want, but if if the creature can't respond somehow to the law, mm -hmm. then the framework of law is almost pointless. Mm -hmm. So, so there has to be, you have to, if you're creating a structure that actually has some kind of control <laughs> over the situation, yeah. you have to create a framework for the law, mm -hmm. but then you have to have the creature itself has to be responsive to the law. So you're talking there about the power of governance. So the, the framework can govern all of the rest of creation, but if the principal highest creation doesn't respond inherently to the law and be governed by the law, then there's no point. That's right. There's yep. no point for that creation. Yep. It's like that creation that is without law. Yes. So what God had to do to, to, to deal with that possible issue, because obviously God's perfect, he didn't create any possible <laughs> issues, yeah. but to deal with that possible issue, it, what God did was create the human soul mm -hmm. in such a way to be responsive to law. Mm -hmm. so, so the human soul responds a certain way. 
Now, let's look at some of the basic ways. We could spend, you know, literally weeks and months of discussion about how the human soul has been created, but mm -hmm. let's look at some of the basic ways the human soul has been created to respond to law. Mm -hmm. The consequence of law is designed to be emotional. The human soul has been designed to receive emotions and to feel emotions. Mm -hmm. So now the consequence of law has an effect on the soul emotionally. Mm -hmm. So when you say the consequence of law, you mean the operation of law is designed to invoke emotion? Or, yes, all, yes. The, all laws are designed, particularly the laws that govern the soul, mm -hmm. are all designed to evoke emotion. Mm -hmm. so, so in fact, they all work emotionally, mm -hmm. like the laws themselves work upon the emotion mm -hmm. and have a emotional response. So they respond to the emotion, they act on the emotion. Yeah. They invoke, they create an emotional response. So as yep. we discussed in the third assistance group in 2016 about God's laws, every one of God's laws are mathematically created. There's mm -hmm. a mathematical formula associated with all of God's laws. And there's a mathematical formula associated with the emotion in the sort of the soul. Yep. So now the two can interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So this is a great thing. But if we look at it from, from a less you know, theoretical perspective, we can see, okay, the soul has been designed to be emotional. Mm. This is great mm -hmm. because emotions are what drive forgiveness and repentance. Mm. So, so, so without emotion, we're not going to really know what to forgive and what to repent for. Yeah. So, so emotion is a key part of understanding the law mm -hmm. and understanding our response to it. Yeah. So having more sensitivity emotionally mm -hmm. is also very important as a goal yes. for the human soul. Yes. So we can see that straight away. So you're saying essentially that the soul itself is designed to be emotional. That's how God designed it. And also designed it to be very difficult to resist the flow of emotion. So that is going to help us in this forgiveness and repentance process. Is yes. It, yeah. uh, imagine if we could easily, without there being any disease or any suffering, resist emotion. Well, everybody on the, in the universe would choose to resist emotion mm. all the time under those circumstances. Mm. The fact is now, when we resist emotion, we get other pains and suffering, mm. uh, physical especially. Yeah. Yeah. So our physical body decays very rapidly. Our physical body has a lot of pain mm -hmm. associated with it. And these are messages mm -hmm. that come from the soul, the suppression of the soul, mm -hmm. to the rest of our body, mm -hmm. you know, physical and spiritual bodies. The, without that feedback mechanism, it'd be highly likely that we'd just try to avoid emotion all the time. Yeah. But in avoiding emotion all the time, we would avoid happiness all the time. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't want that because he no. wants us to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to be happy, we have to have emotion. Mm -hmm. To have emotion, we must be willing to get let go of painful emotion and understand what causes pain yeah so this was all a necessary part of the creation of the soul mm -hmm. if god didn't design the soul this way then we would continue sinning without there ever being any penalty for sin without yeah. there ever being any emotional correction of it mm -hmm. and we'd continue doing good things without ever getting feeling pleasure or happy yeah <laughs> <laughs> what's the point we'd be like robots right yeah not feeling happy we'd all be going around like you know sometimes you see some movies made this way where everyone's walking around totally detuned from everything you know what i mean and that's what we'd be like zombies zombies yeah. in a way you know yeah. totally detuned from everything so and this i find this really reassuring in a in a sense because um so god's process for healing and for happiness and for striving is emotional and i've been designed in my soul to be sensitive to when I'm hurting and when others are hurting. That's actually written. It's in the, you know, the it's source code. It's in the code. DNA of the soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that that's going to happen. And can... also be sensitive to when blissful things happen. Because mm -hmm. you can't have one and without the other. You yes. need both. Yes. So I'm designed to be sensitive. And designed to be sensitive to happiness and yes. designed to be sensitive to unhappiness. Yes. Yeah and designed to have a painful response to selfishness and to addiction and sort of narcissism and a pleasurable response to love, love truth, selflessness, truth, humility, yeah, um, service, all of these things. So, so, yeah, that's a good part about the design that is going to lead me towards forgiveness and repentance, which yes. is 
the way that I can reach a relationship with God and, and achieve things and be creative and actually... But most importantly, to be happy. Be fulfilled. Because that's yeah. really what God wants us to be yeah. in the end. He wants us to have this sense of bliss. Yes. You know, that, that comes from living in harmony with love. Yeah. And, you know, that's his goal. Mm -hmm. His goal is bliss for everyone. Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. Yeah. So there's really an interaction that's happening between law and the way that my soul is designed. Yes. That is creating either happiness, unhappiness, leading me towards forgiveness, repentance. And if God didn't spend this beautiful, like, come up with this beautiful design, mm -hmm. then what would happen? Like, we wouldn't feel happy and we wouldn't feel sad. Mm. But what's that? Feeling nothing. Yeah. You know, and as anybody who's ever, you know, got very, very depressed and detuned out from everything knows, yeah. feeling nothing is terrible. It's a horrible right? feeling. And then anybody who's been placed on drugs that make them feel nothing, they would also know feeling yeah. nothing is terrible. Yeah. So, so, so it's not a good thing to feel nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing to feel something. Mm -hmm. The trouble <laughs> for most of us on earth, though, is that we want to be... We, we want to see that we only want to feel good and we don't we also want to believe that all the pain that is in our lives has nothing to do with our action yeah our, our behavior our belief system our intention our intentions mm -hmm. which is false you know we need to see the relationship between those things exercised unlovingly yeah and the consequence of pain and suffering mm -hmm. without pain and suffering and without pleasure and bliss we would not be able to determine even the difference. Yeah. And at least now, even if most people are trying to detune from pain and suffering, they also see that as they detune more from pain and suffering, they also detune more from pleasure and bliss. Yeah. Right. So they do see a co-relation mm -hmm. between the detunement of the soul emotionally mm -hmm. and the negative consequence of not being able to experience nice things much anymore either. Which is the operation of suppression, isn't it? The principle of suppression in terms of the way yeah. that soul operates. Which is a compensation for suppression. Yes. Right. It's, yes. The, it's the law operating upon the soul trying to suppress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The law is saying, that's not a good idea. Yeah. Right. And helps us to get beyond that and choose to no longer sin against ourselves. Yes. Every time we deny our personal emotion, we are sinning against ourselves. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. this is a basic fundamental truth mm -hmm. we need to understand. We are damaging ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are harming ourselves. We are making our life more painful. We're not going to get happiness that way. Yeah. And this law, this, this relationship between law and creation, the mm -hmm. way God created the soul, helps us to make that correlation. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's, it's a great thing. And without that, you've mentioned, like, where would we be? We wouldn't be happy or sad, but also there'd be the destruction of ourselves, of the environment, there'd be extinction, really, of humanity. Yeah, taken to extreme, mm. we would instantly choose to do things that completely destroy our own bodies, even, mm. if we mm -hmm. weren't sensitive to pain. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, you look, look at a fire and you go, oh, that looks wonderful, and you walk straight into mm -hmm. it and die, Yeah, um, because your body can't cope with that, that fire, it's not been designed to. Um, but you wouldn't feel any pain doing it, so you might do it, you mm. know, and die, you know, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. there being any feeling about it. Or you might do something that negatively impacted upon the existence of people around you. Exactly, which is even yeah. worse, right? Through selfishness Through, or something. Yeah. yeah, and not be sensitive to the fact that that's happened. Mm -hmm. That would be terrible too, because yes. at the end of the day, you'd keep doing it. Yeah. Um, just out of selfishness or some other desire, not feeling any pain because there's no pain to feel is what, you know, what there'd be in that kind of a world. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you'd never stop your unloving behaviour yeah. and other people would be, there'd be huge amounts of detriment to mm -hmm. them with, without there being some level of pain. Now, you look at on earth at the moment, there's already a huge amount of detriment to people mm -hmm. from people like zoning out of their emotion. Yeah. Imagine what would it be like if, they had none. Yeah, if there wasn't a compensatory process going on that's telling them you're feeling less and less satisfied with your life, you're feeling worse and worse through all this detunement, because that very process is leading them towards change, as we've talk, talked about in this session that's a lot. That's right, yeah. yeah. So it's a very good design, yeah. you know, and, and it's for, you know, the, as we learn next week or next time we get together mm -hmm. with regard to this subject, we'll also see that God's own soul is designed to be emotional and that's why when we were made in God's image we've been made to be emotional mm -hmm. 
but there's really good fundamental reasons for it yeah. uh, that uh, that cause us to be reflective about what's mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. And so this design where I'm naturally innately emotional and the fact that the laws operate on emotion means that I'm going to be sensitive to pain, sensitive to pleasure and just become aware of my need to change which is about forgiveness that will lead me eventually to forgiveness and repentance yeah even if i just have the desire to change yeah. to stop behavior that causes pain and engage behavior that causes long-term pleasure mm-hmm. and that's an improvement over not doing anything at all yes but coming to see that our desire to hold on to resentments mm-hmm. causes even more pain mm-hmm. And our desire to do things that are bad to others causes even more pain to ourselves and others. This will also greatly assist us to no longer choose to do those things and to go through the process of forgiveness and repentance. Mm -hmm. So so if God had designed the soul completely differently, uh, it's highly unlikely we'd even see the need for forgiveness and repentance. But it's also highly unlikely we'll ever be happy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because we wouldn't be able to feel. Yeah. We need to be able to feel emotion in order to be happy. Mm -hmm. Just like we need to be able to feel emotion in order to correct bad behavior. Yeah. So it has a positive reward as well as helping compensate or correct negative behavior. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's Mm. fantastic. Yeah, it's great design. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah.